chess. Now, chess is perhaps the best semi-3D on-rails platformer game since Crash Bandicoot 2. This is me, Tom7. I like to play chess, but mostly bad chess. It's just less stressful. Chessful. But these days, it's hard to find a good, low-stress game of bad chess for reasons like this. My friends are either good at chess or refuse to believe that I'm bad at chess. Also, I don't have any friends. Most children are bad at chess, but seem too hyperkinetic and afraid of me. Playing chess online feels like talking on the telephone to strangers, except that in addition to not being able to see them, you have to compete in intellectual combat with them, and you can't even tell if they're laughing at you. Also, I don't know what the internet even is. So, you can play against computers. Computers are, of course, disgustingly good at chess. It's really annoying. But people seem to be obsessed with making chess computers that are good. And if you've been paying attention, you know that it's not really my style to do good things or useful things or things that make sense. So this video is a collection and comparison of many different lousy ways for computers to play chess. Checkmate. You are bad. Now, the main motivation for this is just that it's my idea of fun, but I did come across it because of the following problem. When humans want to handicap one another in chess, one way to do it is by wearing a blindfold. Then you have to remember where the pieces are on the board. But remembering where the pieces are is, like, super trivial for computers. In fact, it'd be more impressive if they can see a board and understand where the pieces are. So is there any analog of blindfold chess uh, for computers? So the idea I came to is this. Uh, instead of letting the computer see the board, the computer gets to see where the pieces are, but not what the pieces are. So it's not blindfold chess, but rather colorblind and piece-blind chess. Now it's also important to prevent the computer from knowing the sequence of moves that were played, because if you get to remember, then it's trivial to know where the pieces are now. So the computer is not allowed to see the game as it unfolds. Rather, it's just given the set of bits uh, and there's 64 of them, uh, because there's 64 squares on a chessboard, and I think that's part of what attracted me to this idea. It's very native representation for a computer. It just gets the 64 bits and is asked to make a move. It needs to figure out where the pieces are and even whose turn it is. It would be hard for humans to play this game because you'd need to administer some kind of memory loss agent to them so that they literally couldn't remember what happened, or else they could only play one move in a game, and that's not very fun either. But for a computer, we can just enforce that. It just doesn't get access to it. So clearly, it's not too easy to play chess this way. But I still think it's interesting. I think a human could tell, for example, that this arrangement is three pawns and the king and rook having castled. Same up here. Just because that's a common thing to do, and it's hard to get in this situation otherwise. And I think really skilled players would have a good chance of figuring out this entire board, given that this is a fairly straightforward idea in the Queen's Gambit opening, uh, which has been played dozens of times in tournaments. Care to try it yourself? Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure out what position this is. I'll give you a few seconds. For those of you that found it, congratulations, you are an excellent student of the ready opening. And for those of you that just want to enjoy the show, the position is of course this one, which is reached after these 20 moves, putting everything in its right place with white to move. Of course, some positions are much harder, especially late in the game because there aren't that many pieces and they can have gotten pretty much anywhere. And so the computer is likely to get it wrong and very likely to make an illegal move. In this position, this turns out to be the white king and it's actually in check because this is a black knight. And so if I try to move any other piece or a piece that's not even mine, then that's an illegal move and the punishment for that typically is that you forfeit the game. This is a little bit unfair to the computer, I think. On the other hand, if we allowed the computer to check whether a move was legal, if it could ask, hey, is this move legal? Or is this move legal? And so on. Then it could learn a lot about the position just by trying out moves. This seems counter to the spirit. So the interface we actually have for the computer is we give it this one 64-bit number, which represents the board, and we ask it to rank all of the moves in order of its preference. So it could say, well, first I'd like to try this, and then if that's no good, then I'd like to try this, and if that's no good, I'd like to try this, and so on. It actually needs to produce a ranking for all possible uh, pairs of squares. 
and the first one that is legal is the one that it will commit to. So for example, if the 14th move that it asked about was this, then that's the move that it would play. So I implemented a program that plays blind this way, and we're going to come back to how I did that. I like playing against it because it's not very good, but the natural question is, how not very good is it? If I pit it against off-the-shelf computer programs, it gets destroyed every single time. So what I want to do is build a number of other weak chess engines that are kind of easy to understand so that I can compare it to the performance of those. Let's start with a really elegant, simple algorithm, which is to just choose moves randomly. In computer science, we say that an idea is canonical when anyone that would have studied that same problem would have come up with that same exact uh, idea. Even aliens, if they had chess, would have come up with this, this way of playing. At any given moment, there's only some set of moves that are legal. Here they all are for black, and it just randomly chooses one of those moves uh, with the same probability for each one. Here it shows a pretty terrible response. Uh, also very bad. And that's checkmate. But aside from being really canonical, what's lovely about this algorithm is that if it gets lucky, it could play any sequence of moves. It could choose the best possible response uh, to what I'm doing, better than even the best humans or computer programs have ability to do today, a sort of Boltzmann brilliancy. So in my mind, this is one of the best benchmark points to compare to. So to do that benchmarking, I'm going to run a tournament between all the different players that I build. Here we just have one player so far, so there's not much you can get out of this, except we can say that random move, when it plays against itself, uh, it's usually a draw. That's what the blue color means. This diagram will make more sense as I come back to it and add more players. Now it's not too important that the players be good at chess, but it's good if they do something. They have some preference. So here we'll have a player that likes to put the white pieces on the white squares and black pieces on black squares. And that'll be called same color. And of course we could do the same idea, but the opposite idea, which is to put white pieces on black squares and vice versa. That'll be called opposite color. So this tends to produce nice aesthetic patterns, which I find agreeable. Now, same color is always trying to put a piece, uh, a white piece on a white square, but it can't ever do that, for example, for this bishop, which must always stay on a black square. So if it can't make any move that puts a white piece on a white square, it'll just make a random move. For example, here it'll move the bishop from a black square to a black square. And this idea of breaking ties with random moves will be a theme uh, among many of the players. Of course, both of these players are bad at chess. They have a preference, but it doesn't really have to do with winning. It turns out that both of them are trying to put their pieces on the white squares, so they do end up fighting it out uh, for control of those squares, but it's really only by luck that the white player ends up uh, winning. <laughs> I see I really started with some interesting ones. On average, it seems that all of these players uh, tie when they play against each other. Same color and opposite color, both a little bit worse than random, it turns out. But note that same color and opposite color sort of do a different thing, whether they're playing as white or black. So in this table, note that the rows are where that player is playing as white, and the columns are where that player is playing as black. And again, this will get more interesting from more interesting players. Let's keep going. So here we have two more players with a preference around where they put their pieces. The player called Huddle tries to move pieces such that they're close to its king. And the player called Swarm, here playing as black, tries to move its pieces such that they're close to the enemy king. Both of these strategies are somewhat reasonable. Of course, attacking the enemy king is good for winning, and of course, blockading your own king has some advantages in terms of defense. Now, you might notice that these pawns don't seem that close to the king, but distance here is measured including diagonal moves because the king can move diagonally. So we have one, two, three, which is the same distance as one, two, three, for example. Now, I'm not going to make you watch all these games all the way through, but it is at least a little interesting what happens in this case. White is able to get its own pieces closer to its own king, uh, sometimes by capturing the black pieces that are near it, and then escorts its pawns to the back rank where they promote and accidentally checkmate black. Checkmate. Over in the tournament, we can finally see some of these players uh, behaving differently. Swarm is, in fact, much better than random move, Huddle much worse, and this kind of makes sense. Uh, if you have a preference to attack the opponent, you're going to accidentally checkmate it sometimes. The next strategy is almost canonical. It's a way that children discover to play chess, which is to just copy their opponent's moves. 
Unfortunately, this strategy is not completely described because after a little while, you won't be able to copy your opponent's moves. Here, I've captured this black rook with my rook, and now black can't do that, and I'm totally winning. So instead of literally copying my moves, this player is defined in a way where it tries to make the board symmetric along the y-axis. Now, as you know, this isn't the only kind of symmetry. If you've studied mirrors, for example, you know that mirrors reflect things horizontally. This is because they're horizontally polarized, unlike lakes, which are vertically polarized. These reflect things vertically. There's a third kind, which is a lens, which flips things all the way around. Uh, this results from circular polarization. I implemented chess players for all three types of symmetry. Here's a nice horizontally symmetric board that it was able to create. In the tournament, well, we still don't have any breakout strategies, so let's just keep on going. Another silly preference we could have is to believe that the board is actually upside down and that the black pieces belong on the bottom and the white pieces belong on the top. Here it is playing against itself and partially succeeding. That one doesn't do much better than random. We could also consider strategies that care about chess things. Here, the CCCP strategy has only the following priorities in order. Checkmate, and if it can't do that, check my king, and if it can't do that, capture a piece, and if not, push a piece deeper into my territory. I'm not going to interfere with it too much so that we can kind of see what it likes to do. You'll also notice that I've drawn the pieces some hats because I think it's fun to anthropomorphize them. And we, you know, just spice it up. I think there's actually a bug with this because it should be pushing its pieces, other pieces, not just that bishop, uh, back and forth. But, you know, they've, they've got hats. Even with some bug, this is our best overall strategy so far. And we see our first instance of an X in the tournament. So each one of these cells represents hundreds of games, actually 700-something games. The red here means that white loses, playing against itself. And the X means that that always happens. In every single game, it was a loss. And that's because this particular strategy is deterministic. It always does the same thing in the same situation. We'll see some more of that. I must admit, though, I get a big kick out of the players that sort of don't even realize that they're playing chess. Here, each of the pieces is represented by the standard letter that denotes that piece, and that's because this player just plays alphabetically. It looks at all the legal moves and puts them in standard notation, and then plays the one that's alphabetically first. It's actually going to just move this knight back and forth between these two squares. Note that capital N comes before lowercase a in ASCII, and I'm using ASCII to quote-unquote alphabetize these moves. So let me just capture that so we can get that over with. Uh, now it's going to just keep moving this knight back and forth. And now it's just going to keep moving rook b8, rook a8, rook b8. So suffice to say, alphabetical player is not very good. There's also a variant of this that moves based on the coordinates rather than the sort of name of the move, and that one's just called first move. It moves lexicographically. And lo and behold, in the tournament, these players are very bad. Alphabetical is actually the third to worst player Although, since there are no X's, you can see that it doesn't always lose, at least. This column on the left gives a numerical score to each player, which is called the Euler rating. The Euler rating is a somewhat standard calculation that you do of the tournament itself from the outcomes of the games. And it gives the name to this tournament, which is Alo World. Uh, you can read about that rating system itself on Wikipedia. I'm not going to describe it in this video. Now, if you have to play chess to the death, you're in trouble because, like me, you're probably not good at chess. But what about the rarer problem of being a chess piece to the death? What I mean by that is, suppose your little soul has to inhabit one of the 32 chess pieces. Then some other people play the game, and if your piece survives the game, then you survive. But if you're captured, then you die. Here we're going to be concerned with the story of a specific piece. Not just any pawn, but this pawn. I can draw its path so that you can see what it does. But it might be clearer to just give each piece a name. Here the pawn called fixed cis makes its way up the board. This is where Granger died. The pawn promotes to a queen, and there's where its story ends. So I downloaded about 500 million games from the site Lee Chess and kept track of the stories of each of the pieces. First, I wanted to understand which is the piece that's most likely to survive. And you can, of course, read the paper if you want, but spoiler alert, it's these extremal pawns on both sides uh, that are most likely to survive the whole game. But we can also talk about a specific piece's story. What's most likely to happen to Geneva here, or the White Queen? Where is it likely to end the game, and is it likely to be alive or dead there? For each of the pieces on the board, and here I'm just showing White's pieces, I computed exactly these things. So here darker squares are where the piece is more likely to end up, 
you could see that bishops, for example, can't get to half the squares because they can never leave their color. And the number on each square tells us the probability that the piece lives if it ends up on that square at the end of the game. So if you look at the f pawn here, which starts in this square, it makes perfect sense that it's mostly confined to uh, this region because of the way that pawns move. It can get back here. Uh, it must do that by promoting to some other kind of piece that can move backwards. And it's most likely to live if it ends up in this top corner for some reason. Interestingly, of all of the possible fates for a piece, the rarest one is actually for this f pawn to die on this square. That only happened 1,200 times in all 500 million games. Getting here and surviving is, much, is more common. Usually you would do that by promoting, uh, but note that since this is on the diagonal, it's possible, although very unlikely, for the pawn to get there that way. So unlikely that it's never actually happened in a game of chess, as far as I can tell. This might mean that there's a hidden achievement for doing it. Anyway, from this study, I ended up with all this data, which gives for each piece a kind of map of where it should go if it wants to survive or die, or do something that's common or uncommon. So I use that data to construct players for this tournament. They're all pretty boring, actually, but I'll describe what they do. Safe seeks out spaces that are safe, where the piece is likely to live. Popular seeks out spaces where the piece is likely to end up, whether it lives or dies there. Dangerous and rare are the opposites of these. Survivalist and fatalist look at the ratio of dying to living on a square. Survivalist, of course, preferring to survive, and fatalist figuring, what the heck, we might as well get this over with. <laughs> Weirdly, it has the best winning chances of these strategies. Next up, we have a group of wimps. This first one, pacifist, does everything it can to avoid checkmating me, checking my king, or capturing any of my pieces. Here I'm able to move my pieces well into danger without any risk, unless of course I force the computer to capture. I tried to make this strategy even worse. Here, generous tries to offer up pieces constantly for me to capture, and no, I insist, attempts to force me to capture its pieces. Looking at the results, all of these strategies do very badly. But pacifist is actually the worst. It's the second least capable strategy of all. It turns out that offering up pieces and trying to force me to capture them usually ends up leading to a drawn game. Whereas pacifist leaves enough stuff on the board that it's kind of hard to draw, and it's easier to mate it by accident. I tried to come up with other simple, terrible strategies. Here the one called Suicide King just tries to move its king as close as possible to my king. Its name, of course, is literal, but also the name of this famous face card. So you'll see that instead of hats, I have drawn the pieces as carefully pixelated playing cards. Naturally, everything came falling apart because these cards must be black. Of course, they represent black pieces, but the Suicide King is formally the King of Hearts, a red card. Anyway, this strategy is easy to beat, as you might expect, but it performs better than even playing randomly. Moving the king aggressively like this is enough to beat rather than draw against unambitious players. Now, I know it looks like I'm never going to finish this table, but there are a few large batches of players coming up. This next one is about traditional engines. This is the standard way that people go about writing chess computers, which computer scientists have been studying for decades. The basic idea is this. For any given board, we want to be able to assign it a score. That's called the evaluation. A simple thing might be to count how many pieces I have left. Then I'm going to do game tree search. The game tree consists of taking the position that I'm trying to make a move for, looking at all possible legal moves, and the positions that result from that move. Now it's your turn, so I look at all of the possible moves that you would have, and all the positions that would result from those moves. I do that for each of the boards. Now it's my turn again, so I look at all the moves that I would have, and so on. Now this tree gets really big really fast. So of course we stop at some point. So when I stop expanding the tree, I can just give a score using the evaluation function to that, uh, to that position. Now the inside of this algorithm, which is called minimax, is that when it's my turn, I'm going to pick the move that gives me the highest resulting score. So far on this board, I would choose d4 because the score of that board where I stopped was 10. Since it's my choice, this overall node can be thought of as also having score 10. But conversely, when it's your turn, you're going to pick the move that gives me the worst score. So here, with these scores, you would pick this move. Maybe it's d5, which results in a score of 2. So I'm not going to get to play this move that gives me 10 or 100 points, because you're going to avoid it. So the red ones get min of the scores beneath them. So min and max give us minimax. And there are many, many, many refinements. This algorithm, alpha beta pruning, and killer move heuristic, and all that. Now, my chess players don't do any of this. 
but that's because many people have already built chess players that do these kinds of well-known good algorithms with great evaluation functions. So one such engine is Stockfish. Stockfish is, I think, the best uh, freely available engine, and its rating is so high that it implies it would beat every human player every time, even running on your phone. So its pieces get the Cylon I. Okay, no, no need to watch this. So looking at the results, Stockfish takes the top slot. It's actually configurable with a number of different difficulty levels, which are here, 0, 5, 10, 15, and 20. And 1M is where I allow it to search 1 million nodes, 1 million of those states in that game tree. It only takes about one second for it to search that. I compared another engine that I found on the internet called Topple, uh, given 10,000 and 1 million nodes, respectively. It is clearly a lot weaker than Stockfish, but, but also all of these are way better than my silly strategies, which is to be expected. Here we see a lot of Xs. The best Stockfish configuration always beats the weak players, whether it's playing as white or black. I can also use the Stockfish engine to play as badly as possible. Here I run the Stockfish engine on each possible move, but pick the one that it likes the least. It's very bad. There's That's checkmate. This is indeed a very bad way to play, but it could be worse. Looking back at the game tree, effectively what I did is take the top level, and instead of taking the maximum score over all of the moves, I take the minimum score. I prefer worse moves. But the way that I decided how good a move is involves this back and forth minimax algorithm, where I assume that later I'm going to play the best move. But of course, when I get there, I can play worse moves. So I might actually get the wrong idea about what the overall worst move is. Such a change would be rather invasive to Stockfish. That's why I didn't do it. But you know, exercise for the reader. Looking at the results, unsurprisingly, this is the overall worst strategy, and it manages to lose to almost everybody. In 1989, we shrank down Gandalf and trapped him inside a Nintendo game to play chess for the rest of eternity. He's known as the Chess Master. So this is a traditional chess engine, uh, but it was written in 1989 for a system that's pretty underpowered, the Nintendo Entertainment System, an 8-bit microprocessor. But I like it because it's an earnest attempt to write a good chess engine, uh, just limited to the techniques and computing capabilities of the time. I'd like to run this in my tournament, and I don't want to do it manually. If we peer inside the Nintendo's memory, which is quite small, we can actually see where it stores the board. These two right here are the two pawns in the center. You can see if I move one, now it's here. So in emulation, this is a fairly straightforward thing to do, to read off where the board is. But I want to be able to feed it in an arbitrary position and have it run its engine on that position to make a move. It turns out if you just modify the board in memory, it goes haywire because it actually stores some redundant information about the board and it gets confused if it gets out of sync. But Chessmaster does support this board setup mode. In board setup mode, it does seem to tolerate me editing the board. So that's what I do. I set the emulator up and fake a series of button presses in order to get it into the state, modify the board, then have it play a move. And now I can play against it in my custom viewer. Maybe we should move Gandalf out of the way. Here the emulator also provides a screenshot of what the NES sees, which should be the same as long as I did it right. Which I did. Taking a look at the results, Chessmaster has two different difficulty settings, and indeed difficulty two is better. Uh, they're in the same category as the strong engines, let's say. But note that both versions produce draws against some pretty stupid strategies too. Here's a perversion not known to the ancient ones. Remember this game tree diagram? Well, it's really pesky how I have to consider both my moves and the opponent's moves. So what if I just get rid of the opponent's moves? With this strategy called single player, I do game tree search, but as if I'm the only one playing. I can't even do this in my viewer program because it won't let me make two moves in a row. But here's an example of what I might do at the beginning of the game. I only look for checkmate and I only look four moves deep, which is often enough here at the beginning of the game, uh, scholar's mate only takes four moves. As an algorithm, this is actually perfectly decent. Most of the time, it's able to find a sequence of moves that can mate, at least while it still has a lot of pieces on the board. The desired sequence and the outcome is shown in this debugging view. Looking at the results, this is a rather good strategy. It's better than Chess Master Level 1. Uh, it always wins against unambitious opponents, but it can't quite compete with Stockfish, which knows that there's another player in the game. Now, how do you think about the best chess player? It's rational, right? And what's more rational than numbers? 
This next weird idea, which I'll use the Tom Academy background for, is a way of turning a number into a game. We've already seen how we can characterize the choices in a game as a tree. Here instead, let's take the interval from 0 to 1, and let's say we're looking at a position that has a choice of three different moves. Then we'll split it up into thirds, each third representing one of those three moves. For each one of these moves, there's some set of moves that the opponent can make in response. Let's just look at one of those, responses to e4. Of course, there are more than three actual moves in most positions. And let's say there's two responses to e4. So we'll divide that space in half. Of course, we do this for all of the moves. But here I'm focusing on the case where I played e4. Similarly, we can focus on the case where the opponent played e5. Let's say there's two moves again. And so on and so on. So the idea now is if I take a line and I draw it through this space somewhere between 0 and 1, the boxes that it intersects are a sequence of legal moves that make up a game. So every number between 0 and 1 corresponds to a specific game. And in fact, each game corresponds to a contiguous range of numbers. So this means that we could look at a specific number, say pi. And actually, since that's not between 0 and 1, we'll look at its fractional part. And that would be about here. We just need some canonical way of ordering the legal moves in any position. And I'll just use alphabetical by their standard move name. So we can watch this game. Let's do it. There's nothing particularly remarkable about this game except that it comes from one of the fundamental constants of the universe. It eventually ends in a draw. So what we just saw was kind of like pi versus pi. Pi playing against itself. To turn this into an algorithm that can play other players, the most straightforward way to do this is at each step, whether it's my turn or not, I'm going to look at the box that my purple number fell within, and I'm just going to zoom in on it in order to give me a new number from 0 to 1. Then I subdivide again based on the number of moves. This time it won't even be my move, but I'm still going to do it. Find the interval within which my purple line lies. Call this 0 to 1 again, then subdivide based on the number of moves. Let's say there's just two here. I like how this zooming is basically a literal representation of a problem that I really end up having. You'll see how it's making my lines really thick and my all of my errors getting really messy. And in a computer, numerically, when I keep multiplying these, inaccuracy does magnify. So now if I have two moves and so the interval falls here, I don't actually know which interval this purple line is in. It's kind of in both. So to implement this, I'm actually keeping a rational approximation of both a lower bound and upper bound uh, of the number of interests, say pi. And I do exact computations on those. And if I'm ever in a situation where I'm straddling two intervals, that means I don't have enough precision and I need to actually kind of start over. So I implemented this for the numbers pi and e, and not surprisingly, they're pretty similar to random. By the way, we can actually think of uh, alphabetical, which picks the first move alphabetically as being the same strategy applied to the number zero, its equivalent. Also in this list are binary versions of e and pi, which use the binary expansion of those constants in order to select the move. Just another twist on the same kind of idea. Of all of these, binary E actually performs the best, and that's because its preferred opening, so to speak, makes more sense than the others. Now two more nice strategies. I kind of wish I had covered these earlier when we both had more patience left. First, min opponent moves just makes moves that minimize the number of responses, that is legal moves, that the opponent has after making them. This is a really simple strategy that encompasses some basic chess principles. For example, checkmate leaves your opponent with no moves, so it's the best one. Capturing pieces tends to be good because then the captured piece doesn't get to move because it's, like, dead. Second, the equalizer. Here, pick a piece that's moved the fewest number of times. At the beginning, this is any piece. They've moved zero times. And move it to a square that's been visited the fewest times. What's nice about this strategy is it tends to move all of the pieces away from the starting position. And even though they move randomly, this does, quote-unquote, develop them and puts pressure on the opponent. These strategies are both much better than random. Minimum opponent moves really strikes a great balance between being simple to describe, and I think anyone would discover that same strategy, and actually performing rather well. It's one of my favorites. Do you remember 10 million years ago when I told you about colorblind and peaceblind chess? Well, now we can finally talk about my not very good solution to this problem. It's actually really straightforward. I break the problem into two pieces. The first step is simply to predict what the actual board is from the 64-bit number, which is all that this chess player gets to see. That's kind of the hard part. Then from that board, I'm going to predict a move. I'm going to use Stockfish since it's a great engine for making moves. If I was able to guess the board perfectly, this would work great. 
but there will be some complexity to that. So how do I take this ambiguous representation of a board as 64 bits and guess the board? The answer, like the answer to all questions, is machine learning. Specifically, I'm going to use a neural network, and the setup here is pretty standard for this kind of thing. I gotta say, neural networks are really cool, they do work, but it is so fiddly uh, to set these things up right. There's all these constants you need to set, and if you don't get them just right, uh, the weights go cramming off into a sea of infinities and nans, which is no good. I, of course, made it harder on myself by building everything from scratch. So here's a diagram of the setup. Each layer has a certain number of cells, and each cell is a floating point number, nominally from 0 to 1. For the input, there are 64 of these, which correspond to those 64 bits. A bit is set to 1.0 if there's some piece in that cell, and 0 otherwise. Then there's a few hidden layers, which first expand the input, and then contract it. Finally, the output is, for each of the 64 squares, 13 different values which predict whether each of the 13 different contents of that square is in that square, independently. So here, for example, it's saying there's a 0.9 sort of probability uh, that this is a black pawn. I also predict whose turn it is and whether each side can castle in each of the four ways. Now the nice thing about this setup is that if I can just take a bunch of boards, which I can get easily from the LeechS database, I can produce billions of training instances. I just take a board that occurred in a real game, I turn it into its 64-bit number, and now I have a pair of an input and an output which can be used to train the network. Here's what it looks like when the neural network is training. Up here are the input bits, then we can see the hidden layers and their activations. This is the output, which is annotated with mistakes if there are any. Let me pause this. Oh, no mistakes here, but here, on this one, it predicted that there's a black pawn here, but it's actually a black knight. I'm also showing the error values in backpropagation. Not much you can get out of that, but it is kind of cool to watch the fireworks. Here are the results of evaluating this as a standalone problem. Uh, almost 20% of the time, it's able to predict the entire board correctly, exactly correctly, which I think is pretty good. Uh, given that this has to have some mistakes since the representation is ambiguous. Um, and of course, when it gets it wrong, it often comes pretty close. The average number of pieces wrong is 3.22. We can also use this thing interactively. Here I can set a bit mask and ask it to predict it. For really easy configurations, it definitely gets this right. Uh, for weirder configurations, well, who knows? Here it hasn't predicted any positions for the white king, which is impossible. And this is going to be one of the complexities as I try to use this to make moves. So let's play against it. The debug interface is going to show the predicted board before uh, the computer makes its move. This of course lets me take advantage of it because I can see whether it has misconceptions. But for the purpose of this video, obviously you want to see. As I play standard moves, it's going to be able to guess exactly what's going on and it's going to make very strong responses. But as it gets complicated, it's, it starts to make mistakes. Here it thinks that my queen is its bishop. And if I make silly moves, here I put the queen in an extremely unlikely situation, offering it up for capture. It thinks that that's still its black pawn. So now I can safely capture the rook. It, now it thinks that's its rook, uh, and so on. So I can really take advantage of this player if I know how it works. That said, Stockfish shows me as losing here. After all, I'm going to lose this rook. This version called Blind Kings already has a little bit of logic beyond the neural network. If the neural network predicts a board that's invalid because it has too many or too few kings, then I fix it using the square with the highest probability for a king. This is because although Stockfish is a really good engine, if you give it an invalid board, it crashes faster than uh, a Bandicoot. But to improve upon this problem where some of my pieces can disappear to the blind player, uh, we're going to do a little trick called the spy check. Remember the rules of color and piece blind chess. Rather than just predict one move, which is often going to be illegal because it gets the the position of the board wrong. It actually produces a ranking of all of the moves, and the rules are the first move that's legal is the one that's played. So I'm going to take advantage of this to do the spy check. Specifically, I'm worried about the case that one of the opponent pieces has infiltrated my position here on black, and that I'm now predicting that to be one of my own pieces. The move that I actually want to play here is knight to this square, if it's in fact this board. That'll be one of the moves that I output. But ahead of that in the ranking, I'm going to manage to put a bunch of spy check moves. And a spy check move is basically for every piece that I've predicted as my own, and every other piece that I've predicted as my own, I'm going to try to move that one piece on top of the other. So up here in this list, I'm going to include try capturing this piece with that one, try capturing this piece with that one, try capturing like this, try capturing like this. And this will include this rook, which is actually a bishop, 
trying to capture this pawn, which is actually the white queen. Because it comes before this legal move, that will be the one that's actually played. This heuristic assumes that, of course, capturing when I'm confused about what the board state is, is better, and it doesn't really have a strong preference about which capture it does. This turns out to help a lot, though. Let's try playing against it. I tried infiltrating the position again with my white queen, which it thinks is a black pawn, uh, but it was able to successfully do a spy check and eliminate it with its rook. This successfully corrects for a huge weakness with the blind strategies. Uh, now their main weakness is just that in the end game, they have no idea what's going on, and it's pretty easy to outmaneuver them. Looking at the results, all of these are substantially better than random, and that's good. So something good is happening here. And spy check helps a lot. Uh, it comes in just shy of the CCCP strategy, which, although it's simplistic, it does have full knowledge of the board and what, where the pieces are, so it has a bit of an advantage. A natural criticism of what I've done with the neural network is that I'm really just memorizing board states and that I haven't actually learned what chessboards look like. Uh, and neural networks are, in fact, really good at memorizing things. We can compare that strategy directly of just memorizing boards that have been seen before and the most popular move played in that position, thus building a sort of gigantic opening book. In the Leech Chess database of 500 million games, there are about 21 billion positions reached. If I wanted to store the move made in each of these positions, one way to do that would be to store a hash of the board, which would take about 64 bits, and the move that's played, which takes 12 bits then this would take about 204 gigabytes. This would be using the most efficient packed representation. If I wanted a hash table, uh, there would be some overhead for that. And even in my completely gratuitous desktop computer, I have only 128 gigs of RAM. And of course, there would be ways to store this on disk or whatever, but, but there's also really diminishing value uh, to storing these. If I look at all of the positions that ever occur, most of them only occur just one time. That's like 76% of them are only seen once. So these take up a lot of space and they're not very useful for playing because I'm very unlikely to ever see them again. And of course, since there are so many, uh, the distribution looks very regular. Here, a log log plot. Um, I really like this diagram. This shows us two competing effects, making this sort of joker smile. On the one hand, most positions appear extremely rarely. This is logarithmic, so that's 76 here. There are a few positions that account for almost 1% of the database, like the most common first move, which is e4. These patterns in the middle are just discretization error, but they look pretty cool. So to make this tractable, I just store positions that occurred more than one time. This is only 15 million distinct positions, and I can store all of the moves that were played in that position over all of the games. And this takes only 500 megabytes, which I can easily expand into a hash table in memory. So to turn this into a chess algorithm, it's really simple. I just look up the position that I'm faced with and see if it's been played before. Uh, if it has, I just take the most popular move in that position, which tends to be a good move. Here it's able to follow along with the queen's gambit declined uh, quite deep, but as soon as I make a little bit of a weird move, it just starts playing randomly, and then it's very easy to beat. This player performs significantly better than random due to its knowledge of openings, but also significantly worse than the blinded players. The neural network that's part of the blind strategy is only five megabytes in size, so it also has 100x the efficiency uh, of encoding these states and generalizing from them, even if it is just memorizing them. So that's a pretty good result. Finally, we're going to fill in the remainder of the blanks with one type of strategy, which is really a meta strategy. If we look at the ALA ratings of all of the players we've seen so far, there's actually a really large disparity between the best players, especially Stockfish, uh, and the rest of the field. And given that this isn't a linear scale, uh, this can cause some problems. For example, let's look at a hypothetical tournament. Now let's say there's two classes of players here, which is more or less what we see. There's the lousy players and then there's the engines. When pl lousy plays lousy or engine plays engine, it doesn't really matter what happens. Let's say it's a draw. But let's say that if engine plays lousy, it always wins. And if lousy plays engine, it always loses. This is a problem for our tournament analysis because although it's clear that the engines are better than the lousy players, which is what we'd expect, it's hard to tell how much better. If it's really the case that they always win or almost always win, then imagine the engines are actually a uh, hundred times better than they really are, or a thousand times better than they really are. You're still going to see this same outcome. Making these engines better isn't going to make them beat lousy any more often than always. In practice, we do see a, an occasional victory of a random strategy against uh, an engine. But ideally, we'd be blurring these lines a little bit, not just for aesthetic reasons, but because it helps the ALO algorithm actually produce more accurate scores. 
The way I want to do this is with interpolation, following the methodology that's used to determine how spicy food is. This is called the Scoville scale. We take the item that's to be tested, some kind of spicy oil, and we feed it to an official tasting genius who has a golden tongue. We also ask this genius to taste some sugar water. Of course, the genius can tell these apart, so step one is done. Then we dilute the spicy oil 50% with sugar water and see if the tasting genius can tell it apart from sugar water. Of course they can, so we pass that round, but we keep doing this. At the point where the genius can no longer tell the diluted solution from sugar water, uh, that's where our count stops, and that's what defines the Scoville scale. So let's do a similar kind of interpolation uh, with our strongest engine, which is stockfish. The way we'll do this, of course, is to just flip a coin, and with a certain probability, either play a strong move using stockfish, or play a random move using, well, another coin. So I introduced a number of different players at different concentrations of stockfish, so to speak. And this does, in fact, smooth out the tournament a lot. Uh, up here is what we're, the graph we were just looking at without these players, and you see a very large peak for the strongest stockfish. Here we see a smoother curve, uh, and this is because of, stock, of players like 99% stockfish uh, that play almost as well, but every once in a while make a random move. As we would expect, the more stockfish you have, the better you do. Even a 1.5% solution is substantially separated from a random move. And even 99.9% .9 stockfish does a little bit worse than uh, pure stockfish. This makes a nice gradient between the strong engines and uh, the lousy players, which helps with the accuracy of the tournament. Another nice thing about this is that we can actually assess how good a player is now by comparing it directly to a specific dilution of stockfish. So this gives us one more pretty good way to say how not good my blind spy check algorithm is. We can say that it's somewhere between a 6.2% and a 12.5% solution of stockfish mixed with random moves. So there you have it. A pretty picture, 30-something lousy ways to play chess. A pretty careful evaluation of my mediocre solution to an unimportant problem. And 40 minutes of our lives down the drain. Condolences and congratulations if you made it through the whole thing. If you have your own ideas about lousy ways for computers to play chess, uh, feel free to suggest them. I might add them to this tournament. For now, it's on to the next project, which is teaching this dog how to play chess. It, it's, going, it's, it's going pretty well. Checkmate.